Okay, my name is Taryn Hart, and I'm with Occupied Media, and I blog at plutocracyfiles.com. And I'm Sam Cedar. Uh, I am the host of uh, the Majority Report at majority.fn, and uh, which is a daily live streaming show and podcast, and also uh, co-host of uh, Ring of Fire, a nationally syndicated radio show. Right, and you do uh, memberships for the Majority Report. Of which I'm a member, by the way. Oh, thank be you. Be um, because of Matt, I'm just going to stick up for Matt since. Whoa, for Matt. <laughs> He'll be very happy to hear that. Yeah, uh, since he uh, somebody quit because of him. I can't believe somebody said that. That's right. Yeah, somebody emailed me and said, um, <laughs> I'm tired of Matt talking. I'm going to quit. And so I'm docking Matt pay for the loss of that member, actually, for the loss of two members. Well, so I'm, that actually making out, I'm actually making out ahead. Right, but I think thing. I think mine should make up for at least one of those. If you, you know, perhaps a new member, but I'm going to talk <laughs> right now for two members. Okay. Uh, and if all goes well, I can get all my members to quit. And if I can continue to dock Matt for two members for every members that quit, I'm going to make a lot of money. Yeah, yeah, uh, that could work out for you. But yeah, the um, we we do uh, 40 minutes uh, free every day. Well, the whole show live is free. Uh, but if you want it as a podcast, the first 40 minutes is uh, free. The uh, second uh, 50 minutes or so is uh, not free. So, right. um, And uh, you can speak to the incredible value of that. Absolutely. Uh, I, listen to, I listen to both hours every day. You've done, oh, I, great. Think, I think you've done the best, um, most consistent Occupy coverage since oh, the well, beginning. Thanks. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I have to say that, you know, uh, I was a host on Air America for um, seven years, six years. Yep. And, um, you know, the, the, the nature of what I do um, on the majority report is a little bit different than what I did on radio. And uh, basically because of the size of the audience and because I don't have the same sort of uh, constraints in terms of um, format, uh, but also, you know, Content-wise, um, I you know I was I've been very disillusioned in many respects um, with the Obama administration, and um, you know there are some things that uh, I've been happy with, so, but many things that have been disillusioning for me. And frankly, um, it it's it's hard as someone who goes through this and wants to maintain my interest in my own personal sort of excitement and hope for the future uh, because at you know, the end of the day, that's a lot of what drives me. I left the, sort of the straight entertainment business to do this um, uh, more uh, by accident at first and then because I really uh, felt strongly about um, the, the stories that I was covering. And uh, when you know, I could see over the course of the, uh, of, of the year whether it was what was happening in uh, the Arab Spring uh, and then in Europe, in terms of Los Ignados and uh, UK Uncut, and then what was happening with uh, Madison, Wisconsin, um, and even uh, stuff that was happening online with, with Anonymous and, and WikiLeaks, that there was a real sense that uh, something that I had felt for a long time was that ultimately uh, the real issue is one that has more to do with outside in uh, and um, uh, the establishment uh, of this country versus uh, the rest of us. And so when the Occupy movement started, I was very excited about it. And, uh, you know, I live in New York, um, and uh, we were down there attempting to do a live broadcast the first week, but it was raining. But um, I think uh, we had uh, Justin Weeds on uh, on the 19th, uh, you know, the, the first Monday after that uh, Saturday protest in September, and uh, subsequently, uh, members of my show uh, got more involved in the uh, 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 Occupy uh, movement and uh, specifically in Occupy Wall Street. And so I've been fortunate enough to have uh, people there that I could contact. And, you know, it was really the, the first couple of weeks were very interesting because I do commentary on uh, you know, sort of the corporate and more mainstream media outlets, uh, but it's usually commentary. And... Uh, that first week or two, I got like th literally a half a dozen calls to go on a bunch of different outlets to talk about Occupy Wall Street because no one, none of these 
none of these media outlets could figure out how to report on it. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, some I did, some I didn't do. Uh, uh, but it was, it was, I, it, it was very apparent very early to me that this was something that was fundamentally different and could not be ignored. So, right. Well, that's yeah. I I did see that. That and did you did you hear about it before the protest started? Like, did you hear about the run? Did you know about it that it was coming up? Yeah. Um. You know, I think if I remember correctly, I think the week leading up to the seventeenth, I had mentioned it as this is happening. Mm -hmm. Um. And didn't know much about it beyond that. Um, and, um, you know, I think I had been maybe in the weeks before I had sort of been, uh, aware of it. You know, I, I read, uh, on occasion ad busters and mm -hmm. I have a sort of a, a situationist international fetish that I've been pursuing for, um, I guess, 10 or 15 years now. And so, um, uh, some of the things I was reading were, were interesting to me, but uh, I think, you know, at the end of the day, the, the, the thing that I think I realized very quickly was that <clears throat> the fact that these people were willing to um, uh, live without shelter, mm -hmm. more or less, um, was fundamentally a different thing. And um, it represented a far greater threat to the establishment than any, uh, you know, protest that I had been engaged with or had covered uh, in the past. Right. So the fact of occupation... Yeah, I mean, I think you know when you're when you're willing to say to society like I'm going to live without one of the fundamental um, uh, uh, pillars of survival. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you're basically saying to the establishment, you have no leverage over. Right. And uh, I think that was very, I think that was very scary. To I mean, I and I think you know from. Uh, the perspective of people like uh, Bloomberg and these other cities, I think that's why for them the paramount thing was to get them, was to shut down these occupations. Um, and uh, I think that was, you know, tactically um, and strategically a good move on their part. I don't think in the end it's going to be um, uh, effective because the things that people are protesting about uh, the thing that they're, you know, in, in protesting, I think, even doesn't even cover um, the response uh, because I think there's this sort of a this is this is different than just protesting uh, because there's a lot of activism involved in this and organizing. Um, I think at the end of the day, the things that are motivating people are it just are not being addressed, mm -hmm. and so um, I don't think it's going to be at the, in the end a successful tactic or strategy, but um, short term, I think it was on the on the part of you know, the, the establishment. Right. Right. And, uh, you know, you've talked, you've kind of been saying that you think that the spring, you know, things are going to kind of calm down over the winter and that the spring's going to be a big, um, push from Occupy. Um, and what are you referring to? I mean, are you thinking there's going to be reoccupation or there's going to be new strategies or, you know, this is something I've been saying almost since September, uh, before, you know, because simply because uh, the winter um, presents, you know, uh, it's, 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 you know, uh, logistical problems. Right. And um, I think that uh, with, I, I, you know, I, and I have nothing to base this on. Uh, right. <laughs> other than, you know, I mean, I, I don't want to imply in any way that I know anything. Right. Uh, but, um my sense is is that when you saw the occupations of the um, of shutting down the ports uh, on the west coast, and when you saw the uh, attempts at a general strike, I think that, and and when you saw labor um, warm to the movement, mm -hmm. um, I think that we're going to see Occupy as a vehicle, because you got to remember in this country, um, uh, general strikes are illegal. Right. And unions cannot um, uh, involve them. themselves. Right. They cannot organize. They cannot uh, call for them uh, in their capacities as unions. Right. And so, in some ways, what the unions needed was another entity that could do what they can't do. Right. And um, and I think the time is right where um, 
where people are going to realize that their greatest strength uh, lies in withholding their labor. And um, I'm just convinced that, you know, spring, early summer, we're going to see, we're going to see uh, more and more attempts at it. And uh, as the, um, the election comes down to, um, you know, uh, uh, President Obama and uh, more than likely uh, a plutocrat, um, and, you know, I consider President Obama, you know, someone who, at the very least, while there are some areas where I think he's he's liberal, I don't think he's uh, leftist. And I think that um, he is um, been pursuing uh, policies that I think uh, basically have put the wealthy elite in this country uh, first. And um, for whatever reason, I mean, there's, you know, it's... Uh, there, there, there it could be uh, many different reasons in which you know they could be driving that, and so I think um, there's going to there's there's now an outlet for this uh, tremendous frustration uh, and frankly uh, suffering that the American people have been going through, and in frustration of you know I personally think that when President Obama was talking about changing Washington, I think the perception was that most people perceived was uh, the sense that um, our government was not functioning and not responsive to the needs and the desires of the vast majority of people in this country. And um, I think we're going to see in the spring uh, more, uh, we're going to see more of this sort of labor activities, and uh, I don't mean union, I mean labor. And, um, and I think, uh, you know, what the Occupy movement is doing in terms of Occupy Our Homes. Um, you know, originally, the uh, one of the people who, um, oh God, Dave DeGraw, I think his name is, yeah. um, had talked about uh, as early as, uh, I think, February or March in 2010. Yep. I've been talking about this notion of how many people within um, a 50-mile radius, a 30-mile radius, uh, an hour or two's drive from from Wall Street specifically uh, were uh, you know suffering through foreclosures were on food stamps were had lost their jobs and uh, he had talked about what if this ninety nine percent of uh, Americans you know basically just all came down to Wall Street and um, you know I think one of the biggest challenges is connecting the occupiers uh, to those people. And when you see things like Occupy Our Homes, um, when you see the, um, uh, the, the the protests and the occupation uh, that took place in East New York, um, and you see this around the country, there's a lot more that those, those bridges are built. Um, if they're successfully built, uh, it's laying the groundwork for, for a real mass movement. Um, and you know these are people who are disenfranchised. Um, who have lost a lot of hope. Uh, if you're someone who's going through a foreclosure process, there's uh, there's a certain amount of shame, and we're being you know we're taught by society that if you can't uh, pay your bills, it's necessarily your fault. And the more that people are educated to the notion that this is not just a function of uh, you making a bad choice, it is a function of an entire system that has become so corrupted that it was driving you towards these choices, that it was misinforming you about the, the choices you were making, uh, and that it's uh, fundamentally unfair uh, in the way that our government has responded to uh, your bad decisions uh, and to this uh, massive amount of corruption versus the bad decisions of the people who were fundamentally responsible for the entire crashing of our economy. And uh, that uh, fundamental unfairness, I think if people begin to digest it and are aware that uh, there's something systemic that is going on here. Um, I think uh, will you know will, will add to the to the size of this movement and to the power of the movement. Yeah, that's all. That's all. I agree with pretty much all of that. I um, had interviewed um, Boots Riley in Oakland, and he was involved with. Um, and and I mean, I think Oakland's been a great example because I mean they are the ones who called for the general strike and also the port shutdown, the West Coast port shutdowns, um, and 
the, and I exactly what you said, which is that labor has been pushed back so far that they can't call, they, they now need, you know, outside forces to come in and organize the types of movements that actually could um, give them leverage, give labor leverage, and, you know, form that kind of a movement. And so I've been really interested as well in those types of things. And it's actually something, you know, you said really early on, and um, – which is that, you know, Wisconsin, originally there was kind of calls for a wildcat strike, and it was almost moved in that direction, but then got funneled into electoral politics. And I see yeah. Occupy, I mean, that's kind of the lesson, I think, from yes. Wisconsin. Would you agree with that? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there was a moment, um, I think I was out there one of the last Saturday protests, uh, perhaps the biggest one, and, um, you know, the cops and the uh, firefighters show, uh, showed up, and, and they weren't even part of that uh, Walker bill. And just the idea that um, you had uh, teaching assistants from uh, University of Madison with uh, welders uh, and sanitation workers, um, people who, you know, and this goes back to, I mean, Kevin Drum had a great a piece called uh, Plutocracy Now, yep. uh, six to eight months ago, and uh, he had talked about this, uh, this, Split in the um, uh, in the left that took place in the '60s during the social emancipation um, uh, struggles, uh, where essentially the um, the the hippies uh, split from labor. Uh, you know, I'm oversimplifying, but that that was more or less it. And the idea that these teaching assistants um, from University of Madison were, were finding solidarity with these. Um, the uh, uh, welders and other union and tradesmen was uh, what was was very encouraging. And then mm -hmm. there was talk of a uh, of a general uh, wildcat strike. It's got to be a wildcat because it's half Hartley uh, bill, and and not just half Hartley, but all the implications that have come from that, right. which which is the the unions sort of uh, taking a less um, uh, adversarial role. With uh, management, essentially, um, that has sort of grown throughout the years, and and their subsequent weakness as well, um, and uh, that was all very quickly funneled into sort of an electoral energy, and I don't think that electoral energy is bad, um, right. and uh, but and and maybe it was sort of inevitable because there were specific. Villains essentially that could be thrown out of office. Right. Uh, so it was sort of the the you know the physics were such that it was easier to point it in that direction. Mm -hmm. But um, that is definitely one of the lessons uh, that I think uh, came out of that was that I think you know you can have electoral energy. It, you know, the, I think maybe the argument. I would like to say you can have electoral energy and also have a wildcat strike, a general right. strike. But maybe the argument is that uh, the more adversarial and more uh, militant you get, the less electoral uh, power you might have because it's harder to cross party lines mm -hmm. um, and you polarize more. Now, <clears throat> uh, it may have been the case, and, and, and that, that could be a legitimate argument, uh, but I think... <clears throat> Uh, Occupy's strength is not in electoral politics, um, you know. And I've had this argument with people who, are, you know, uh, who think that you know Occupy should throw their weight behind Whoever. candidates. And right. uh, I just don't think that's the purpose of the movement. I don't think that's where the the strength comes from. Right. Yeah. I actually I think that you've been talking some about R Ron Paul, and I'm also. I'm aligned with where you are, I think, from Ron Paul, except maybe one thing, which is that uh, there's been kind of a strain among the left of like, well, it's good to have him in because he raises some of these issues. And, you know, I think that the objection I have, at least from an Occupy standpoint, is that he raises, you know, I, I think a couple of things. And one is that he takes the, the focus off economic populism. Um, and so, you know, so you don't, I mean, I think that, you know, Occupy has been able to encompass really all of these issues, but from a perspective of, you know, we've lost control of our government to these corporate interests, and 
you know, that's manifested itself in a lot of ways. As to where Ron Paul has a few issues that maybe we agree with, but not at all from an economic populist. I mean, I almost look at him as like, uh, you know, a kind of postmodern wedge candidate, you know, like somebody that really could wedge, you know, and, and, and that's, and that Kevin Drum piece that you're talking about, which is really influenced by, um, kind of winner take all politics, hacker and Pearson analysis, mm -hmm. right? Which is, and, and I think that that is the key. I mean, I look at it and it's like, oh, wow, we have this amazing ability because we aren't able to be wedged in the way that we were previously in kind of a what's the matter with Kansas way because we really did make a ton of progress. But I think that you're seeing the wedges coming from a different place and maybe Paul is, you know, that's, that's what I feel like I'm seeing, like that there's this wedge on the left that Paul is exploiting. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's accurate. I'm not terribly worried about it because mm -hmm. he's not going to win no. uh, the Republican primary. And, no. um, you know, the, uh, and so, and I agree with you that, you know, in some respects, uh, he takes, well, you know, look, this is the hard part, is that, you know, um, from my perspective, I think I, I consider myself uh, a leftist. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, my sense is, is that as a leftist, um, or I call myself that because I think, uh, to me, sort of economic populism is, is, is one of the sort of the, the biggest issues for me. Um, I, I am a civil libertarian as well. And, you know, when you start getting into those issues, that's where you know, Ron Paul has some attractiveness, but, you know, as I talk about on the show, I don't think he's as much of a civil libertarian as he is simply someone who is against the federal government. Um, I think he's right. perfectly happy with uh, the states getting rid of a lot of the civil liberties that uh, you and I would perceive would be very important. I think that's why the evangelical um, uh, community is um, so supportive of him, because uh, they see the states as a great opportunity to get rid of... Uh, you know, a woman's right to uh, choose or, right. uh, you know, contraception, uh, contraception or yeah. uh, prayer in schools or uh, teaching uh, evolution uh, or uh, the, the list goes on and on. And, right. um, you know, uh, and frankly, you know, under a Ron Paul uh, administration, if a state uh, wanted to deny black people uh, the right to vote, they could do it. Right. Uh, the federal government has no authority uh, in that regard. And so, um, Ron Paul is problematic in that respect. He's problematic in the respect that um, when uh, people perceive a problem with uh, with uh, the economic situation in this country and the power uh, dynamic in this country that is a function of the economic uh, uh, situation, um, you know, uh, Ron Paul just says the Fed, and you know, somehow magically. If there was no Fed, right. all these problems would go away. And right. so, you know, uh, the, the, the greater problem that Ron Paul uh, represents is a function of, of, of people being somewhat illiterate and looking for easy answers. And, uh, you know, uh, the way that people um, uh, deify Ron Paul, and I'm talking, you know, I don't see this in terms of commentators so much, uh, but uh, in terms of supporters. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the way they deify him is very reminiscent of the way they deify, uh, you know, that uh, Barack Obama was deified. Right, and, right, I you know, agree. Well, well, don't you need, you know, how many times do you need to learn that lesson? Right. Uh, but I think, frankly, um, Ron Paul's far more dangerous because, uh, you know, the other thing that uh, Ron Paul has no problem with is, um, in fact, having no problem with it is, is, is an understatement, is the idea of uh, corporations uh, polluting our air and our water and our commons, and he would never have a public space uh, to be occupied. Uh, under Ron Paul's ideology, there is no public space. Every space is owned right. uh, and should be in private hands. The public should own nothing. Right. And um, I don't think that people fu uh, fully grasp this. Uh, and the implications of it. Uh, you w are worried about corporate power in this country. The last thing you want 
is a so-called American libertarian because all they believe in, essentially, is corporate power. Uh, they just believe that it shouldn't be exercised through government. They just believe, essentially, that we should be living in a, a neo-feudal environment where corporations uh, supplant uh, dukes and, um, and counts and kings, right. uh, where they have their own little fiefdoms and, uh, you know, instead of uh, sending out, you know, the, uh, the peasants uh, armed with, uh, with swords and, um, you know, uh, uh, bows and arrows, uh, they have money. And uh, that's the way that they influence. And uh, so I, I don't think people fully appreciate that vision. Um, and I think, you know, Ron Paul, to his credit, from a uh, political standpoint, doesn't get into it that much. Right. You know, he, he knows that his attractiveness is in talking about uh, the um, uh, corruption of our government. Uh, it's the solution that he has, which is problematic. Right. He knows that the uh, value and the attractiveness of his position is in the idea that we don't want empire. Well, that's right. But um, do we really not want to help uh, with the, the AIDS epidemic in Africa? Uh, do we, uh, do we uh, really um, not want to uh, provide tsunami relief? Um, uh, do we really want there not to be a United Nations? Do we really not want um, things like... Um, a uh, some type of um, uh, international standards uh, to combat global warming. Um, <clears throat> these are the things he won't talk about um, because he knows better. Uh, right. uh, because look, there's a reason why his numbers have doubled in Iowa from uh, four years ago, and that's a combination of attracting young people uh, in this environment, uh, talking against the banks. You know, talking about reforming the Fed, which is good, but, you know, there's no value in getting rid of the Fed uh, because we'll simply go back to the situation that led us to create the Fed. Right. And, uh, uh, and so uh, he, he stays away from that and, and, and uh, because the evangelicals have been sold and now understand the value of having a guy who doesn't believe in a federal government protecting our civil liberties um, in the states the evangelicals realize is a great way to move uh, their sort of theocratic visions forward. Yeah, I mean, the ads he, he <clears throat> ran in Iowa were um, pro, pro-life. pro The kind of baby, he had a thing where he claimed to have seen a baby in a trash can right. ad that he ran in Iowa. Um, so, I mean, that's where a lot of his support, one assumes, is coming. I mean, that's certainly the issue he thought. But it's not just coming from pro-life. I mean, understand that they, they sent out uh, their top campaign officials to 300 evangelical churches in Iowa. Mm -hmm. And they weren't there uh, brandishing, uh, the, I'm sure they mentioned uh, Ron Paul's pro-life uh, bona fides. But that's not, that's not the argument that they're making. It's the, the federalism. Their argument they're making is that with a Ron Paul, the federal government will no longer be an impediment to things like school prayers. The federal government will no longer be an impediment towards making sure that your kids get educated in science. The federal government will no longer be an impediment uh, when it comes to uh, 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 campaigning in churches. Uh, the, the, the federal government will no longer be an impediment to anything that you want to do in this state. Uh, that, um, you know, uh, approaches your vision of theocracy. The other thing my understanding is that uh, they said, well, while we will cut off aid to Israel, we'll also cut off aid to all its enemies. Um, right. Because that was a big issue for the evangelicals because, you know, uh, the Christian Zionist movement um, is, is very strong amongst these people. And so, um, you know, don't mistake uh, Ron Paul's uh, attractiveness to evangelicals is a function of his pro-life, uh, you know, so-called pro-life bona fides, because all of them have that. Right. Uh, the reason why he was the number two pick of evangelicals was because um, they, his ideology, which is against the federal government, is uh, they see is unshackling them to promote a more theocratic uh, vision. Uh, they'll just do it state by state. Right, right. And that's going to be very attractive, I think, in South Carolina. And um, I wonder if that's been factored in. You know, everybody's 
uh, people don't talk about uh, Ron Paul in, in South Carolina, but I imagine uh, he may surprise people there because, you know, there's a longtime secessionist um, sort of strain in South Carolina uh, by, uh, by uh, the, uh, the sort of the, 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 the Christian right. And uh, I, I imagine that if they, if they have the opportunity to educate uh, the uh, South Carolinians who are looking to secede from our, you know, profane society, um, uh, they may find that very attractive. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, my general take is that, you know, the same as you said, where there's this weird kind of, this will be the answer to all of our problems like there was with Barack Obama if we elect this person. So kind of funneling too much energy, I think, into electoral politics from an Occupy perspective from those people. And there is a significant kind of Ron Paul uh, support within the Occupy movement. I don't know if it's Ron Paul support or if it's more correctly, um, you know, maybe people who are just interested in those handful of issues, but I think it does. You can say he's also an anti-establishment person, and right. I think you know that's probably at the end of the day. I think that is a more. Um, uh, I think it has more to do with that as to why they're you know involved and attracted to the Occupy movement. Is that I think you know um, uh, that broader character of of anti-establishment um, is is attractive, and you know uh, the guy wants to end the drug war. Of course, he wants to end the federal drug war. Right, right. He's, He's got fine. no problem with the state uh, drug war. Right, right. Um, yeah, I agree. And so, and and actually, I mean, and he has adopted, and even people, other people on the right, like Tim Carney, who you debate with regularly on Dylan Radigan, have adopted um, a language about crony capitalism. Um, that kind of adopts these kind of catchphrase type things that I think are attractive to people in the Occupy movement. But again, okay. their but again, their solution is and the Fed by and large, right? Well, yeah, I mean, the solution. You know, when I when I debate with Tim Carney, uh, the solution for him is uh, to end corporate uh, uh, capitalism uh, and, and crony capitalism. The solution to him is to shrink government. Right. Because, you know, I don't understand that. Well, the understand. I mean, look, uh, and I think Tim is is a pretty sincere guy. Yeah. Um, but I also think that um, his perspective gets used by those who have a, a very pro corporate agenda, because um, it's one thing to say like, yes, I'm against corporate uh, cronyism, and I'm against our government being corrupted by corporations. Right. But when you say then the solution to this is to make government smaller, right. uh, to make it have less power. More anemic, yeah. Um, well, we're supposed to believe that, um, uh, you know, that somehow, like, you know, if you, um, if you have uh, the, the, uh, the corporation is using government to enrich themselves, that somehow if there was less government, they wouldn't be able to enrich themselves. No. What they've done is the corporations have corrupted the tools that the people use to right. constrain their power. Right. And, and, and that's what people must understand, is that the government is a reflection and a projection of the people's power. That instrument has been corrupted by corporations. The solution is not to shrink the people's power to curtail the corporate uh, power. Uh, and uh, corporate excesses. Mm -hmm. The solution is to strengthen that tool mm -hmm. and to uh, uncorrupt it in some way. Mm -hmm. you, it's not going to get any less corrupt if it's smaller. Mm -hmm. It's just it's just going to have less of a ability uh, if it was less corrupted to influence um, our society. And uh, I, you know, people don't take it to the next step uh, far too often. But I don't see it as a threat. Um, I don't see it as big of a threat uh, to what's going on. I mean, I, I you know, I think um, we tend to be um, uh, more thoughtful about these things, and so uh, there is a big debate now about you know how should liberals perceive uh, Ron Paul, and I think it's enough to understand 
that, um, you know, how he gets to his positions will fundamentally di dictate what his policies would be. You know, I, like I say on my show, it's, it seems to me uh, that Ron Paul is going to be far more successful in the part of his agenda to get rid of the EPA uh, than he will be in uh, shutting down our empire. Uh, and uh, so um, uh, people should understand that, but if they don't, at the end of the day, uh, I don't think it's our biggest problem. Right. Right. You know, I mean, yeah. I think, like, you know, I think right now because um, uh, you know, uh, Occupy is um, at least in some of the media centers, um, and in its biggest uh, sort of um, uh, concentration is less active um, and less visible. I think you know we end up uh, there's a time to reap and there's a time to sow, and right now right. Uh, people are sowing, and part of that is to discuss these things. Right. Right. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I mean, and that's kind of how I look at it, is it's this, you know, electoral sideshow a bit while there's been somewhat of a pause. I mean, I think, you know, there's some there's some things coming up. There's the um, Occupy, the Congress. Yeah, on the up. 17th. Yep, yep, and I heard uh, Jeff Smith was on your show today saying that he right. was going to be attending, and my video editor is going to be attending all the way from Montana. So I think, oh. yeah, so hopefully there's going to be – a decent, I think, I think there's quite a bit, I'm hearing quite a bit of energy for it. Um, yeah. And yeah. you know, I'll, I'll say, it is interesting because, um, you know, I had uh, Matt Taibbi on yesterday. Yesterday, yesterday, and, yeah. And, um, you know, the, the Occupy movement has made it easier for me to uh, accept the fact that um, I am more than likely going to vote for Obama at this point. Right. And, because, you know, I, I think Chris Hayes first said this to me about the Occupy movement, that it has sort of um, unleashed his imagination as to what we consider politics. Right. And, uh, you know, I think for, um, for so long, uh, so long, but, you know, certainly through the Bush administration, there was such singular focus on electoral politics uh, the, on the left and among net roots and right, yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah. and uh, and amongst you know the anti-establishment crowd, and uh, there was a lot of unity because uh, you know we all had one sort of like singular focus, um, and um, uh, it is breaking that habit and seeing politics as something broader than that. And so, uh, you know, like Taibbi was saying in his piece the other day, which, you know, um, as soon as I read, I was like, oh, yeah, this is exactly what I've been feeling. i got to get him on. Uh, when you see uh, Occupy has broadened my sense of what is politically relevant right. and, um, and necessarily decreased in my mind um, – it's not insignificant, it's still very significant, but the relevance, the relative relevance of electoral politics. And, you know, it's very hard for me to uh, ignore it uh, totally, and partly because I find it somewhat entertaining, and uh, partly because <laughs> right. I do think there are implications for it. I mean, right. you know, um, I think it's a good thing that we finally have a, uh, a head of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. I think that makes... That's going to make a real difference in people's lives. And yeah. um, when you look at, you know, the idea that Scott Brown in Massachusetts, uh, the senator now because he's running against uh, Elizabeth Warren, has to come out and support it, uh, support that recess appointment, it's going to make it a lot harder for the Republicans to deal with that recess appointment, which means that the guy is actually going to be able to do his job. Right. Uh, and that has real implications. It, it um, it may be, you know, putting a Band-Aid on a much larger wound, but, um, you know, you're going to keep germs out of that part of the wound, I guess, to really make a bad uh, <laughs> metaphor. But, um, you know, so there, there's relevance there, and, uh, but um, it, it, it's, been, it's been fascinating, and it also, you know, I think it also helps I mean, I've always been very attuned to what's happening legally, um, but, you know, when you see the attorney generals and when you see uh, Montana, uh, you right. know, at the very least, attempt to uh, ban corporate money in their politics, uh, these are all very good things. Yeah, and, I mean, it's not, it's not so much saying that 
politics aren't important, certainly, but the idea that what we need to do is elect better people, right? I mean, that, that if we get the right person in there, then those things will happen, right? That, and, and it certainly did, I mean, I remember, you know, all of the early questions about like, you know, well, why don't they have demands and these types of things were all, um, I think, symptomatic of the narrowness of our vision that you're talking about being expanded. That the idea that, you know, social movements can change everything that's being talked about, the way things are decided, the way people feel pressured, um, you know, is just a very different view than the idea that the problem is the people that are there, as opposed to that there are some systemic problems that there are, that really, you know, movements are going to change in a way that just focusing your energy into electoral politics. So, and that's not to say that I think, um, you know, that there's a problem with voting or any of those types of things, or that I don't think that there's going to be a difference between Barack Obama and Mitt Romney. You know, and, you know, the left was really so affected by the Nader <laughs> debacle, I guess we would call it, that, you know, we really, you know, focused in that way. But this definitely did broaden my perspective of what can be possible just to watch the dialogue change. Right. And, then, and then, like you say, you know, people, even people on the right, feel compelled to start talking in terms of the 99% and the 1% and all of, you know, and Scott Brown feeling compelled to support Obama's appointment of the consumer. And, and by the way, like I've interviewed a bunch of people, um, you know, who were involved with uh, the stuff that, you know, went on with the um, uh, housing market, you know, the kind of predatory lending. And that was the thing that they thought could really make it, that really will make a difference is that agency that they think that that has a real potential to make a real difference is having that yep. there. So I think that that is really important. But like you say, it's, a you know, the, the, you know, the idea of what's important and how we go about it, you know, definitely changed for me. I mean, I remember hearing when the debate was going on of like, you know, should Occupy Wall Street have specific demands? Um, hearing Angus Johnson, who runs student activism, who is a, a, a historian of student activism. Um, I remember him, you know, making the argument that no, they shouldn't, and why, and making it from the perspective of social movements. And so he's making a historical argument based on the civil rights movement and all of these things. And I remember just realizing, like, oh, that's what this is. This is a social movement. Like, we haven't had one, not in my lifetime. Right. I hadn't had one. And so I just didn't understand how they worked and how they influenced politics and how they influence all of those things. You know, I mean, the fact that, you know, Martin Luther King never took power, never had electoral power. But look at the changes that the civil rights movement made. You know, they just make them in a very different way. And a lot of the questions that we ask, that were asked of Occupy Wall Street, I think fails to fundamentally understand how social movements can make changes. Right. And, uh, you know, uh, the... Uh, I, uh, you know, early on, I was also of the opinion that there w w there should be no demands. Mm -hmm. The demand is um, implicit. There's something wrong. Fix it. Right. And um, you know, there and are plenty of solutions. Deeply, uh, systemically wrong. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. And um, really, at the end of the day, you know, uh, the when you look at what progress has taken place in this country, it has all come essentially, uh, the dynamic basically works like this. Uh, people are very, very, very upset, uh, and the establishment is worried that there is going to be some destabilization of society because of it. And so they take steps that they hope will essentially co-opt right. and buy off uh, people's contentment. Right. And, you know... Um, that's a good thing. That's, that's a good thing. <laughs> and, right. uh, you know, so the idea of, like, you know, uh, uh, figuring out, uh, you know, for uh, the establishment what is going to be the easiest thing for them to swallow uh, that will placate you is not your job. Right. Uh, the, 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 the job of, uh, of the Occupy movement is to make it clear that they're not going to go away. Right. And, um, you know, it's quite clear that people want them to go away. 
Right. And so uh, they better come up with uh, solutions that make uh, their movement um, obsolete. Right. And uh, so, you know, I, I, it's very encouraging. And, yeah, you're right. It, it doesn't mean that um, uh, people should not be involved in electoral politics. Right. The idea is that the, 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 the sort of the, the concept of what we consider politics uh, must be much larger. Right, right. And include all of that. Well, I've taken a ton of your time. I really appreciate um, you taking all of this time. And you've been, you know, so generous. You've, you know, been so generous with the movement. I saw you did. Um, there was the Occupon, and just anytime anybody's asked you to help, you have. And Thanks. your coverage of it has been, I think, just second to none. Uh, and so people can come. Where do they? Where do they come? How do they become members? Well, uh, you know, if uh, you go to majority.fm and okay. uh, there's some big red buttons there where you can listen to, to uh, the shows and you can listen to past shows. Uh, still working on uh, a way of accessing our archives easily, but you can scroll through. You can hear all our free shows and um, you can listen live every day at 11.30 a.m. Eastern. Uh, and to become a member, you uh, hit the uh, become a member become link a member? And, uh, and sign up. But, uh, you know... Uh, Listen to the show. And make sure you like it uh, before you become a member, or not. You don't have to. You don't have to like the show to become a member. In my opinion. <laughs> right. Uh, I mean, so. just to support independent media, um, and and also, and then you have, I think, have stuff where you can like all your like all your stuff and uh, donate. Right. Tweet. We have uh, donate your account, which is a uh, mechanism where essentially you can donate to us uh, one tweet a day, uh, one tweet a week, one tweet a month. Or uh, one Facebook uh, post a day, a week, or a month. Okay. Uh, we don't spam it. We always uh, push out, uh, I think maybe uh, it's almost always uh, content from the show, whether it's, um, you know, always something uh, content from based uh, on the show. So, uh, and it, it just gets the word out. It drives uh, people to listen to the show. And, you know, one of the things that, um, uh, early on, it was suggested to me to, you know, to go to like um, uh, the Democracy Alliance or one of these uh, outfits. You know, I had some vague relationships from my time at Air America uh, to some of these big funders. And, um, you know, frankly, uh, it's a partially psychological problem I have uh, in terms of... Uh, uh, of, of, of having uh, people uh, control purse strings uh, for me. But I, I wanted to maintain my independence and um, right. never have a concern that I'm stepping on someone's toes or uh, saying stuff that, um, you know, uh, that funder uh, has, uh, you know, too much stock in the, this company. They prefer you don't say anything about it. Um, and uh, so, you know, it's uh, the show is... Nearly 100% financed by uh, members. The the rest is uh, occasionally I have a sponsor and uh, but uh, you know like coffee, coffee, just coffee. Um, right. But uh, and so it's it's a way of maintaining my independence. And so uh, hopefully people uh, like what I do and um, uh, you know it's important to them enough to uh, keep it around. Yeah, I think you should use your donated tweets to talk to Breitbart since he blocked you. <laughs> uh, that was actually pretty funny. Uh, yeah, you know, the first part, I really must have gotten under his skin. I didn't realize that he had blocked me uh, for two or three weeks. And he kept tweeting at me, uh, and it wouldn't show up in my um, my timeline. I guess, uh -huh. like, if you get mentioned by someone who has blocked you, it doesn't, it doesn't show up show in your up. timeline. Uh -huh. And so I get, you know, messages from me like, aren't you going to respond to Breitbart? And I'm like, well, I, I haven't heard from him. Uh -huh. And then one day I went to his site. Uh, you know, to his Twitter thing, because I thought, oh, is the guy sick or something? And um, uh, I realized that he had blocked me. Uh, he really is sensitive about the fact that he never had any success in Hollywood. And, mm. in, you know, for much of my professional career, I was an actor and a writer and a director. And, and, and you did stand-up, too, didn't you? I did stand-up uh, yeah. very early on. I mean, I guess I was more of a comedian than an actor, but I did a lot of sitcom right. acting. And right. um, so I was very familiar with the type that mm. uh, re resented not being uh, sort of having some measure of sort of Hollywood success. And he's right. got it written off of him. And, uh, <laughs> had some exchanges in person and uh, 
online that have reflected that. So. Yeah. Well, I'm gonna I I'm gonna donate my Twitter account, so you can feel free to use. Oh, that. great. For, to, you, talk to, to talk to Breitbart if you so choose. I think you'll get, you would get a lot of people to donate if you used it for that purpose. So That's an interesting uh, theory. I hadn't thought about yeah, that. But. Yeah. And he can't, you know, and then he can just block us one at a time. It's like, you know, occupying Breitbart's Twitter. Well, you know, I don't know that he's blocked the majority report, actually, but it's uh, because oh. it's uh, the, the Twitter uh, handle for the majority report is majority FM, uh, right. and I uh, tweet at Sam Cedar. But, right. um, Nevertheless, I think I'll, I, I got to figure out another way of getting under his skin because uh, <laughs> anything I can do to have him um, distracted from uh, his normal horribleness, I think is right. uh, stealing emails is a and to... whatever he's doing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for taking thank all you, of Karen. this time. I enjoy the, I enjoy the, the other interviews you've done. Oh, good. I've watched good. Them. Good. Uh, yeah, great. You should have Boots Riley on. Good. You know, I, 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 as soon as you said that, I was thinking about it. So Yeah, uh, you should. Be- you should. He's, he's thinking of doing a lot of really interesting things. I think Oakland's really interesting. I think it's good. Yeah, you know, that was, this, that was the site of the uh, last uh, general strike in this country. Right, exactly. Exactly. So. so, well, thank you so much. Thank you, Karen. All right, bye-bye.